My name is Kim Ashmore. I'm with the City of Centralia, and I'm uh, currently the Street Stormwater and Fleet Manager for the City of Centralia. Um, our guest speaker today is Mindy Fone, and she's with Kitsap County, and she's been with uh, Bremerton uh, Public Health, uh, 20 years of experience. Let's uh, welcome Mindy to the to the presentation. Okay, well, good morning. It's great to see this wonderful turnout. So I'm going to try to get a little oriented here. And I'm going to tell you about probably my, I hope nobody else from our staff is here, my, probably my favorite work group. So I'm going to talk about um, removing and preventing non-stormwater discharges. Um, how many folks here from phase one jurisdictions? <coughs> Wow, this is great. Well, you guys probably know an awful lot about these topics because you've been doing it a lot longer than a lot of, how many phase twos in here? Yeah. <laughs> this is really for you guys. So phase ones, please feel free to jump in and say, oh, we don't do that anymore. That's a dumb way to do it, but we found this. So anything that has to do with these topics, please feel free and just speak up. So this is going to be interactive. So I'm going to talk about what drives our program, why in Kitsap we care about certain pollutants maybe more than others. Um, I'm going to then go through the, the programs, talk a little bit about outfall screening. We all just love that for, for 2007 and our first phase two permit. I'm going to talk about, and I think there'll be a lot of head nodding when I'm talking about that. Spill reporting, we do it a little differently in Kitsap. So I want to talk about our approach and maybe it could work in other places. Then I want to get into the commercial facility inspections. A little bit about integrating all these different programs into the future for cost effectiveness and really for removing these non-stormwater discharges. I want to hear from three people. What do you want to get out of this next 50 minutes? What works? What works? Thank you. Anybody else? What doesn't work? What doesn't work? <laughs> You'll hear that. You'll hear that. And can I get a third one? What do you really want to get out of this? How did you prioritize? Oh, I love that. Okay, so that starts with our program drivers. Thank you. That's my plant in the audience. Um, <laughs> so in the Kitsap Peninsula, and I'm not sure about other regions, quite honestly. I've been in Kitsap for 20 years working on water quality issues. So my nose has kind of been a little more local, and in the last couple of years, a little more regional. In the 1990s, some of our water bodies were in dismal, dismal condition in terms of fecal coliform bacteria uh, levels. Well, our health district got a few grants and they started monitoring around the county and it was pretty bad. It was pretty bad what we were finding. And so we were doing these watershed plans. It was pre wira watershed plans and um, our jurisdictions, our environmental groups, all our interested citizens, they took these really seriously. And out of those watershed plans came the, the notion, we really needed a stormwater utility, but not just for stormwater, to also address on-site sewage, on-site septic system issues, and agricultural waste. So the three different utilities, or three different groups, were going to go ask the commissioners to um, fund these three different programs separately. And um, rather than do three separate asks, they got together and partnered and they did one ask. And that was the birth of our surface and stormwater management program, which we've just rebranded as Clean Water Kitsap. So those watershed plans were really valuable in getting us started. Shellfish is really important in our region. We had shellfish beds that were open, we had shellfish beds that were threatened and that were being closed. And we had shellfish beds that had been abandoned since the 1960s, and people held no hope that they would be open again. Um, we have small streams in Kitsap. We have no large rivers. And our, our existing, our past stormwater systems have really um, uh, caused some severe erosion issues in some of our small streams in the more urban areas. And during the watershed planning, it was recognized that maintenance of the stormwater systems was really important not only in the right-of-way, but on the other side of the property line, on private properties. And fecal coliform, we had TMDLs up the wazoo coming down the pike, and you'll hear more about that at lunchtime. So 
Um, we found this report, and I highly recommend going and looking at this. It's from 2002, done by the EPA of the Phase One permittees um, across the nation. And what was interesting, they said, when it comes to our IDDE programs, when we do outfall screening, we don't find hardly anything. <laughs> but by contrast, over 185 of discharges found and corrected each year were a direct result of citizen complaints and calls to the hotline. This is 2002. We're like, wow, that's pretty cool. That's kind of an effectiveness thing. So looking at that, we decided to take a look at our own program locally. Um, so what we did was we did a summary report. So we took everything and put it together. And we said, you know, what have we done from 2000 to 2010, and where did it get us? And so we compared the different um, methods and results of what we had done and put it in a summary report. Now, when you get your, um, you get this slideshow, there's, you can hardly see it, but there's little tips <coughs> boxes periodically. And um, so we have where you can get these reports, where you can get these materials. The other thing I want to let you know is I have uh, 20 packets of materials. You can come up and get them at the end. And anybody who wants one mailed to them, I'll mail it to them. And as I go through the talk, I'll let you know what's in that packet. This report is not in the packet. You don't really need it, but anyway. So, well, look what we did. We did a comprehensive outfall screening program. The folks went out, so those dots on the map, that's Kitsap County, and from 2000 to 2008, they went out and located outfalls. <clears throat> so, what did they do? It was so comprehensive. It was county and private. They mapped the wazoo out of the county. They just went crazy out there. And they went down to six inches, a bunch of overachievers in, in that group. And so um, they found 1,509 stormwater outfalls, either from private property or from the county system. And um, you can see how many were part of the county system. So we have a lot of private systems out there, you know, private discharges going into, the system, or going into our receiving waters. So what they found was, you know, limited success. Anybody else get this kind of uh, limited success? Yes. Yes. So what we all found, so the good thing was we found some outfalls we didn't even know were out there. We found buried outfalls. We found outfalls that were broken and in terrible disarray. But we did not find a lot of illicit discharges. And we found more of them on private properties. Okay? And the only, the only tool, we did the full screening, you know, all the different chemicals. Fecal coliform was the one that really worked for us. And that's really nice because our driver is shellfish in public health out there. So. That matched up pretty nice. Um, the program cost about $125,000 annually. Okay, so I think that's real similar to what other folks found. So then we took that data and we compared it. And we said, well, visually we found two illicit discharges in eight years. Chemical analysis for the county system, we found three. And, um, but our pollution identification and correction program operated by Public Health, which is a partner program that's funded out of the stormwater utility, they found a whopping 277 failing on-site sewage systems for animal waste issues. And out of those 277, those are all coming from private, going directly into receiving water, and only six of them were going into or coming from our MS4 system. <coughs> And our reporting hotline, we had nine, over three years, we had 93 um, reports that were confirmed as illicit discharges. So that's discharges and connections. I kind of intertwined those two. So we said, wow, where are we going to get the most bang for our buck? It's the folks who are seeing what's out there, the eyes in the field, and our reporting hotline. So, um, with the reporting hotline, we all had this requirement, phase twos, to establish a spill reporting hotline in February, on February 9th, 2009, or February something, February 8th, 2009. Does anybody remember that? Yeah, so we got to So what we did, um, the public works directors got together with Department of Emergency Management for Kitsap County, and they said, why don't we use one phone number for all of us? 
and they agreed to that. So it's the cities of Bremerton, Paulsboro, Port Orchard, um, and Bainbridge Island, along with unincorporated Kitsap County. We're all phase twos. We have no phase ones in our area. So we used our um, Kitsap One Live Call Center, which is during business hours, and we incorporated um, the ERTS calls that come in, and we encouraged our field staff to report um, to this number. So we set this number up, and so what I have in here for folks who want to see how this works is I have the, the two tables that the call flow people use for where calls go, and it's all about notification. This does not have to do with response and cleanup. Each of the jurisdictions handle that separately. But what I want to point out, the reason this works is it's very clear. In an emergency situation, it goes to 911, DEM, they modified their standard operating procedures for all these different kinds of spills. So it meshed with this system. And the magic is they do the notification for us in emergency situations. So those notification requirements that go to DEM and Washington DEM and all that, they do that. Um, Non-emergency situations, um, then we have examples of those and then the um, public works for their MS4 is notified, and then they take care of it as they see fit. So it's very clear. We've had to modify it a couple times to make it work. I mean, it was, it was not too easy to do, but now we've, I think we've got it down. <coughs> so once we um, put together our reporting hotline, all those calls came into the call center, and it goes into our um, system. And so we hit one button, and we get a report at the end of the year, and I let our partners know how many calls came in total, and how many went to their jurisdiction. <coughs> so it's a pretty nice, neat, slick system. Um, we do have, you know, I think some of the questions I've got when I've talked to other folks about this is how do you handle after hours calls and things like that, and that's built into the system. Um, so we said we would like to sustain this hotline because we've had it for five years now. <coughs> and so we have reminder trainings every couple of years. We train our summer field crews. I think a lot of phase twos, you bring in a lot of uh, summer help into your parks program, your public works program. We bring in quite a few. And they have to go through, um, this is part of their initiation training, basically. Um, and what we showed with citizen surveys is about 40% of the people out there know who to call because we want to call 911 or we want to call um, this Kitsap One number or their public works. So we said, let's enhance this tool. Let's try it, let's enhance this. And one of the things we wanted to find out was who's calling. So about half the folks calling the hotline are the public, which is nice, that's good. And then we also have internal staff utilizing the call line. Remember, so you guys ever get an ERTS and it goes, to your roads crew, it goes, then it bounces over to stormwater, and then it bounces over to the city manager, and then it bounces, remember that? I'm, nobody had that happen? <laughs> so, you know, they were bouncing all over the place. It goes to one place. And even our field staff, when they saw something, even if they were gonna respond to it, there's just a less than five gallon spill, they're gonna clean it up with their spill kit, they would call it in. Because it was like, you know, this is really cool, we get to count, and at the end of the year, we all learn how many you know, spills were out there and how many were um, cleaned up. So um, you can see the top three things that people call about. Vehicle fluids, erosion, muddy water, and sewage. So they're, they're the, the smelly things and the visual things, right? So we played on that. Has the hotline funded? Um, Kitsap County, unincorporated county funds the whole thing. Do the cities pay into Kitsap mm -hmm. One? Kathleen, do you know? I don't think so. I don't think so, but those calls that they, for instance, for the city, when they get transferred to the city, to be able to have like their own personal call number. Yep. Uh, it's worked out well. And the thing, you know, I used to work for her, <laughs> for um, City of Bremerton, and the deal was each city said, well, we want people to call us. And we said, well, let's try this out for a while and see how this works. And I, I think, you know, after a couple of years, we're pretty feeling good about it. They can call you for the potholes and that kind of stuff. So, so Jana Erickson on our staff obtained a gross grant. I'm not even say what that is, but um, so the whole point was a lot went behind this: social marketing, research, and.
failed trials, oh my gosh. And we partnered, thank you, with the cities of Port Orchard, Paulsboro, Bainbridge, Gig Harbor, Port Angeles, and Bremerton. And we all got together, they all got together, I should say, under Jana's direction, and came up with this graphic in the end. And they advertised this, did a campaign, strategically placed it on the ferries, which is something all of us cities in that Kitsap Peninsula um, rely upon for messaging, bus ads. And so, um, so that got out there. And this is open source. You can use this, you can modify it. I think Kathleen's putting it on their uh, street sweepers now. And um, it looked nice at your in your community too. So if you wanna get that, you can get that from us. So they did this campaign and what we found was we saw an increase in citizens calling. So um, it was effective. It was, um, they, people could understand what it was about. So I put this slide in here because, um, you know, education outreach is really an important part of your IDDE program, as long, uh, along with some other things we'll talk about. So the brochure on the left, that's from the 1990s. We're going to tell you every little thing about what to do if there's a spill. Isn't that enticing? <laughs> <laughs> and then, then we tried the hometown hero. This is Leslie from the PIC program in the red, and it's wordy, wordy, wordy. We're going to tell you more. We're going to tell you not as much as that, but a little, you know, we're going to still tell you. And we're going to use real pictures and show you what an illicit t discharge looks like in a receiving water. That bombed. That completely bombed. And so Jaina says, let's do an infographic. So this is my new hot buzzword besides collective impact is infographic. You can tell so much. The center of it is the storm drain. A lot of people know, despite what you think, in our focus groups, a lot of people know where these go, what happens when you put stuff in storm drains and where it goes. And the three top visible, um, the visible uh, illicit discharges that you see. And you've got the happy, you know, the happy critters at the bottom. And that's what we want to protect. So that's what I have on the alcohol screening and spill reporting hotline. Any questions? Okay, great. So I'm going to switch gears. How to start your commercial facility inspection program. So we have three inspectors that run this program. And this was one of my favorite projects. I got to work with them in the field when I was working with Kitsap Health for two years. And I went out with them and did these inspections too. And I learned so much about stormwater. And I learned a lot about business owners. And I learned it from them. These are people, people persons? What do you call it? They're good with people. Those are your inspectors. They gotta be good with people. They can't just wanna do it and walk away and, and file their papers. They like to talk to people. So they are really valuable. So to start the program, they started the program in the mid-1990s when we started our, our utility. So um, they, they, this is from them. They said, you need to identify your commercial properties with storm facilities. So in Kitsap County, only half of our commercial properties actually have storm facilities. So there's a gap right there. Half of the commercial properties in Kitsap County are not in this program. That's something to think about when you're in a rural area. They said, gather the contact information, such as your recorded property owner and your property manager. Map the systems. You need an as-built or drawings before you go to site visits. They started by using an access database, and that is open source. We have shipped it out to other folks. You can use it if you want to. It would, you know, we don't use it anymore, but it's a really great way to start. And then what they do is they query the system monthly for a list of properties for initial and follow-up um, inspections. So I'll go a little bit more into that. So when they do the site visit, it's a spot check of the system and the housekeeping. The question is, are they doing some regular maintenance? So they're not checking every single catch basin, but it's a spot check. And they identify deficiencies and they, they only speak to the owner or manager if there's a deficiency. 
if everything looks good, they leave the property. But if, if there's a problem, you know, some, you know, it's usually, what's the number one problem out on commercial properties when these inspections are done? Lack of maintenance. Sediment and CVs. That's it. That's number one. Um, and they provide technical assistance. They're instructed to spend as much time with the property owner or the property manager as that person needs. Take the time. And they do. And they, they say they will be, they show them their system. There's a new property manager. They show them. They take the time and walk them through their system. And they always encourage a maintenance contract. Because the goal is that all those commercial properties get a regular visit, it's a routine maintenance contract, and there's a big benefit to encouraging this. So the letters, example letters, are in the packet. Um, they first, if they pass the inspection, they get a thank you letter, and it's signed by me. My title is Water Quality Manager, and we talk about water quality in the first paragraph. We are working really hard with these folks that at least they get the idea there's some sort of association between their storm system and water quality. If they fail, they get a duty to maintain letter and they're, they're on the list for a reinspection after 30 days. So they've talked to somebody, hopefully, they get that letter and then in the letter, they're in, and the letter is signed by the inspector, not by me, by the inspector. And they're encouraged to call the inspector and work with them on, you know, if you need maintenance, I'll, I'll provide you some technical assistance. So um, if, if they go out for the, in, the second inspection, there's a, a process diagram in the packet about how this works. So you don't need to write this down. Um, they get reinspected if they fail. They get it. We give them a second chance. We're kind of nice. So we give them a second chance. And if they pass that second chance, they get the thank you letter from me. Um, if they don't pass, they get a notice of violation letter. It mentions a fine of $1,000. And it quotes, you know, the, the code, the county code. And then we re-inspect. And if they fail, so they've been given a lot of chances at this point. They go to code enforcement. And I have to tell you, I think the inspectors at Pierce County were deputized. Is that true? Heather here? Yeah. Yeah. Our guys really want badges. <laughs> They're so jealous. Um, they would love to be deputized. They do wear little Drain Ranger badges. <laughs> but I said that decision's not mine, and someone else has made the decision. So this is what they this is what they say. This is their advice. Have as built or drawings for the sites. They now have them on their tablets. They have field. We've gone paperless which was no easy task. It's integrated with our cartograph system, with our asset management system. Um, they have tablets and they have the as built on the tablets. They also email them to the property managers. Um, clear communication. These are inspectors saying, you need to have clear communication, you guys, with the property owner, the property manager, with the business, and with the maintenance provider. Oops, sorry. And establish a working relationship with the authorizing agent for each property. They say, set appointments, speak, speak to the owners if they're in another state, and there's a lot of hand-holding. So this is what he does about once a week. He leans on the door in my office and he says, hey Mindy, I'm heading out to clean up the county one side at a time. And they really, you know, they make a difference and they know it. They really know it. I could tell you stories about Eric. He, so Eric one day, he says, I just don't get it about apartments, you know, the ones that have, you know, car washing in their parking lots. So he went out, he created, a, he didn't even tell me, he didn't tell anybody. He created a survey and he went out and surveyed all the managers at a bunch of apartment complexes. And he came back, he says, do you know what? I said, what? He says, most of the apartment complexes in unincorporated Kitsap County require in their leases that per, they have uh, language in the leases that do not allow vehicle washing. I said, really? He says, yeah, all they want is for us to support them, provide them materials and send letters and so they can put stuff in their newsletters. I had no idea. You know, Eric went out and figured that out and so that's how we handle apartment complexes. So that's something that works, I guess. 
So in this program, what you see on the top is since 2009, we collect metrics. This, these two are metrics that knock people's socks off. The percentage of properties requiring corrective action. Okay, so they get that duty to maintain letter. And what that is, is 40% of the properties in 2009, on the first visit, they needed maintenance. By 2013, only 11% of them need maintenance. So by, by encouraging those contracts, those maintenance contracts, we've seen that, that reduction. The other thing is the properties failing their second inspection, so that's you know that group you're having to deal with now. We are down to one percent, the one percenters that are failing that. We have never had to find anybody. We've come really close, but we haven't had to yet. You go to every single facility every year, and it's, so is it the same population? Yes, that is such a good question. She asked, do we go to the same facilities every year? We do. Um, I tried to go to every other year as we started to see these numbers go down. I got huge resistance from the inspectors. Huge resistance. They said, no, they need us every year. I said, okay. So. How many facilities do you have countywide that you guys are responsible for? Uh, they inspect 600 properties. That's commercial properties. And in our facilities, we have 600 ponds. Just to give you a start, we have uh, 10 or 12,000 catch basins. So that's, I'll talk about, yeah, our whole maintenance program versus, so commercial facilities exit 600 sites. You have three inspectors then that are doing 600 private commercial facilities throughout the county. They're doing a lot more than that, a lot more, and you'll see that in the end. Okay. It's remarkable the work that they get done. Can you distinguish between business inspections and private yes. facility inspections? Because I'm hearing a little about yep. Thank you very much. That is an important distinction. He asked, what's the difference between a business inspection and a private facility inspection? They're very different. As we all know, on a property, there will be multiple businesses. And so, People who are in local source control program, those kinds of programs, they look at each business and what type of materials they're handling and storing and their processes and meeting other requirements, not just stormwater. Our view is the property, we are inspecting the facilities, the properties, because the property owner, no matter how many businesses are on that property, the property owner is responsible for the runoff from that property. And that's a very key point in a lot of our outreach. It makes things very simple. And local source control, their job is a lot more complicated. So maybe just to clarify, you've got 600 then property inspections you're doing with three inspectors? More than that. <coughs> you'll, you'll see all the work that they do. It's remarkable. It's remarkable. Um, so, oh, another question? You know, that's their, their um, that comes from the inspectors. They say, we can get more done, and it's more effective. And when you check the, um, the ones, when you check the uh, structures that are most likely to have sediment in the driveway, the ingress and egress, those ones, and other, you know, by the back ramp, the uh, loading facility, loading area, they check key areas where they think there's a problem. They do look at tanks very closely. They look at ponds, the inlet and outlet structures, you know, those kinds of facilities. They're looking at every piece of it. But when it comes to CBs, you know, if you've got a property with, like the mall, has a ton of them, it would take two days to inspect every single one. You get in there and they're all pretty clean, they're on maintenance. So the question is, does this even make a difference with water quality? I mean, they're doing this, the systems are clean, and so here's an example of some work that we did back in 06 to 08 is this is, um, I sure, nobody has run into a restaurant with a food problem, dumping it out the back, their dumpsters leaking, and I'm sure you guys heard all about this. So this is what it looked like on the upper left. On the upper right, 
is the swale out back. They rebuilt that thing three times, but they never cleaned up their housekeeping. So it got greasy and you know rat traps everywhere. And so um, I was working with health, and um, I basically threatened them with, about their food permit. I said, you know, this is a really big issue because you're attracting rodents. And I think this is a health issue, and maybe I'll start talking to the food inspector that come in and works with you. They said, wow, maybe we ought to clean up this mess. So they did a retrofit, cleaned it up. The swale looks really good. And we had two sites that were real similar. And this is just fecal coliform bacteria. But all that other gitch, it's, um, you know, it's BOD, it's grease, it's just, and you're attracting rodents and animals. So the blue is the fecal coliform level before they took care of things. And the red is the fecal coliform level after. So we saw huge reductions in bacteria levels um, at the, the site level. Then what we did in Silverdale over a couple years, we got 100% compliance in Silverdale. And Silverdale is our most urbanized county area. And it discharges into Dyes Inlet, Clear Creek. And downstream of this area you see is, um, off the map, is open shellfish beds. They were abandoned in the 60s, and we got them open. 1,500 acres upgraded to con conditionally approved. And the runoff from Silverdale is threatening those beds. So we need to clean up our act in Silverdale, basically. So by doing this project, getting the 100% compliance, good housekeeping, there are box and whisker plots. So the top one is before, and, and the, it's before on the left and after on the right. And the top one is in Clear Creek. And the bottom one is the marine station at North Dice Inlet. And I was amazed because I thought if you cleaned all the systems, it would take quite a while for the response in the receiving water. And these are statistically significant. It's not hocus pocus magic with statistics. And um, we were so amazed that the response was so quick. And this is our, our theory, is that cleaner sediments were landing on top of dirty sediments. And that in the summer months, we saw the bacteria levels go down in Clear Creek. Those are the, the low level, stream, stream flow is lower and the stream warms up. And we just, those were the numbers that really were dropping, were the summer numbers. And we think cleaner sediments were landing on top of the old icky sediments or the old food waste or whatever. So it worked. Um, enforcement, enforcement takes practice. Education is first. Um, Property owners responsible, messaging. We involve our health district with solid waste and food waste issues and dumpster issues. You know, we in our code, you guys might have something. Take a look at your codes, your solid waste codes and your on-site, your sewage regulations. They might be able to help you with enforcement. They help us a lot with enforcement. Um, for a dumpster, it has to be leak proof according to the county code. And if our health district, they can, uh, they can write a, uh, what's called an NOCB over there. They write them in five minutes. They don't labor over anything. I think they have it on like one of those auto things and they just fill it in with the code and boom and send it out. Um, they're very swift and efficient with their enforcement. And noncompliance does go to our county code enforcement for things that um, the health district can't deal with. So that's about our commercial inspection um, program. So this is what the inspectors, these are their responsibilities. 630 commercial properties, they inspect those annually. We have 600 ponds and other facilities. They look at those twice yearly, before mow and then the wet season. They do them in November after it's been raining. Um, they do major culverts in the county every two years. Um, they respond to customer requests for information. So like community development and private systems looking for information. And then they do our, you know, required storm response. Um, they have a storm watch list and they go out and look at facilities after major storms, like all of us do. Um, they do 130 customer site visits. And I think all of you know those drainage complaints are usually private property issues where neighbor Joe is dumping collected water and now he's dumping it on neighbor John. 
that kind of stuff. They're well versed in drainage um, law and they say the same thing every time to these folks. Actually, we need to put some information together. And um, they used to do locates. Remember when that law came into account? Was it last year? Locates were required for storm systems. So we've gone to a paper system for those because our whole system's mapped. So if anybody wants to talk about that offline, I will, we uh, got it through. So basically we saved an FTE of time and it's a lot more efficient. So these guys do 3,000 to 5,000 actions annually. They do a lot of stuff. And the thing, we went from four FTE down to three. So one of those FTEs went over to our retrofit crew. And the neat thing is um, they have relationships with the property owners and they're really into green infrastructure. They're, they're part of um, trying to do this transition and um, they're starting to talk to property owners about, you ever think about converting your parking lot, adding some buyer retention? Try this, try that. And they've actually had two property owners take advantage of our cost share program and change um, the runoff from their parking lots from no treatment to a high level of treatment. So I want to talk a little bit about educational materials. These are all in the packet. So the big one is, this is what they use most often. They talk to someone, they say, oh, you gotta have maintenance, and it's just a general brochure, and it has three BMPs in it, the most common ones, and it has a list of maintenance providers. So this is what they use most frequently. So I want to talk about handling common discharges and business sectors. Fundraiser car washes. Ooh. Anybody dealing with this? Or you got all solved? <laughs> Okay, so um, the inspectors really like this because there were three clear messages that the property owner is responsible for the runoff. We're not chasing groups. We're not, we're not doing any of that stuff. We're dealing with only the property owner. Very simple. Hi there, Mr. Property Owner. I understand you have um, fundraiser car washes every weekend all through the summer. And... Um, um, <coughs> You know, we really, really can't allow that because it's going right to surface waters. Did you know that all soap is toxic to fish? Did you know every time you have an event, it generates a thousand gallons of soapy, dirty, polluted water? And you, the commercial property owner, you're responsible for that runoff. Now you have three options, and the options are very clear in our vehicle washing fact sheet. It's just a little card, very clear. The inspectors love that card. Has anybody seen Ecology's vehicle washing booklet? Yeah. 50 pages or something. I mean, it's great if you want to get to all the detail. I would not give that to a property owner. So with this approach, and if the property owner was really mad, they gave him my card. <laughs> they said, well, you'll have to talk to my boss. You know, she's really mean. So, And a lot of those property owners called me. And I said, those three things. <laughs> I said, and these are your three options. So what do most of these folks do? They stop having them, and why? They don't want to be responsible. They don't want to be responsible. It runs up their water bill, they have kids running all over the place, and it's a liability. We got some bad press, but we stuck to our messages, and it worked. It really worked. So we have no sites in un unincorporated Kitsap County that hold improper car washes. So this is the card, and the inspectors, it's just a the thing they like about it, they designed it basically. They said, we want something like this that's kind of, we can just give it to them and it has three points and it's real simple. Dumpsters and compactors, there was a session earlier. So I'll touch real lightly on this. Anybody have any of these in their jurisdictions? So wet compactors, the seals leak after a while. So um, they just talk to the store owner and they usually go to corporate for a lot of these and say, you guys need to change this out. You need to do it soon. And they say, oh, we don't have any money. Well, you really need to do it soon. And they're pretty good about it. We've had a couple. And um, a lot of them just don't know that that drain goes where? Yeah, it goes to surface water. They think it goes to the sewer system. So um, we've really had no resistance. We've had a lot, the ones where we find them, they're really embarrassed. They're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that. Failing septic systems, for our area, it's a big deal. Half of our uh, sewage is treated by 
personal on-site sewage systems. So we just, uh, when we find those, we just pop it over to the health district and let them take care of it. So they're really great about enforcement. And then um, maintenance shops, we did a partnership with all those people on the bottom. Thank you very much. And we used social marketing and came up with this kind of poster. And we tried it out on the maintenance shop managers and workers, and they really like it. And we, um, we give them out free. And then we assess each year and find out what percentage are still on their walls. So it's about 75% remain on their walls, or they're all tattered, so we give them a new one. And, um, but we have never assessed if they actually change any behavior. So we've got a gap there on that one. You guys can use those posters, I encourage you to. All this stuff was, was developed for everybody to use. Um, mobile businesses, there was a gross grant, and all those folks at the bottom partnered. It was led by Snohomish County. And so um, that was really interesting because mobile businesses are challenging. So it's something we all have to stay on top of. And these are the cards that go with them. Any questions on mobile businesses? Restaurants, are they a problem? Yeah, um, so restaurants, they um, have turnover a lot and they do the wrong things. And so, same thing, we went with a poster. Small farms, our health, our health district, we have a solid waste regulation under the health district, and they use that and then force the small farm owner into voluntary compliance <laughs> with the conservation district. Floor drains, I used to think, I thought we were immune to it. I think I used to brag. Like, oh, we don't have any problems with floor drains connected to the storm system. We found two last year, so I think we're going to look at that more closely. So these are our inspectors. That's Rocky, Rocky, Eric, and Chuck. So if you ever want to get some information, they're great people to call. So in conclusion, this is what we looked like in 06. Very separate, very separate programs. And then we've started to integrate these. So this is what we're doing. And this is what we look like, we hope to look like in the future. Um, that IDDE work, that's gonna come into the inspector's wheelhouse. It used to be separate with the monitoring people. They ought to do that. And then you can see on the left, we wanna enhance the, the spill reporting hotline. And on the right, bring in our septics and our, our small farms in a little more closely into the program. And I think I've really covered all these. The big one is relationships. Um, just having those relationships with the property owners is real important. And um, utilizing partnerships with a shared vision. So one of the things we have is all the mapping is online now on the web. So they can pull it up on their tablets and show it to the property owner. They really like that. They want to do a risk assessment. The inspectors want to go out and kind of figure out who's most at risk and then prioritize the properties. I want to talk about the permit compliance. Um, we're real supportive of the new language for IDDE. You can easily meet it and be effective with an O&M and facility inspection program. Very easily. It's cost effective and it's good for water quality. I really like the new manual by Herrera. It is thick, but when you open it up and start looking at it, I think it's really user friendly. And that's all I have.